Trish, where are you? Where'd you go? Oh, Trish. It's okay if we if we don't start off good to back up and start over. Everybody's human, right? Hey, we're talking to a person that turns around and has to go back a lot. Oh, well, me too. Who doesn't? Oh, yeah. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bible, please find the book of Isaiah in chapter 46. And this morning we're going to be in verses 1 through 10. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 1 through 10. And as you're looking for that, I remind you that we stand in honor of God and His Word. When you get there, if you wouldn't mind standing. It's amazing to me that next week we're going to have our egg hunt. And... Um, I read something the other day that said, um, how is it that you can take a kid and they can pick up 5,000 Easter eggs in a little under 10 minutes, but it takes them three days to pick up their room? <laughs> if you want to see a sight, you'll come out here and watch these kids. Uh, I'm thinking, though, you know, with all that candy, instead of putting it in those plastic eggs, why don't we just scatter it out over the lawn and see how they pick it up then? <laughs> well, that would be funny. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 1 through 10, beginning in verse 1. Baal bows down, Nebo stoops, their idols were upon their beasts. And upon the cattle, your carriages were heavy loaded. They are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs, I will carry you. I have made and will bear, and even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder, they carry him, and set him in his place, and he stands. From his place shall he not remove, yea, one shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. Amen. Remember this, and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we know that your word will not return unto you void. Therefore, we look to you, we look to your word, we look to the power of the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today. We give ourselves to you, Lord, to be instructed by your word. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our salvation, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In ancient times... Men and women worshipped idols. They made themselves statues and carvings of figures in the form of what they believed to be gods. In ancient times, men and women worshipped uh, what amounted to the expression of their imagination, and that imagination was influenced by sin, that imagination was influenced by Satan, not by God. Even now, in every different culture, uh, there are different gods. But upon close inspection, what we find is these are, in reality, all the same gods, just given different names to suit different cultures. Amen. All the idolatry that we read about in the Bible, all the idolatry uh, that we see, uh, that we find in primitive cultures today, but we still find subdued in, even in advanced cultures, all the idolatry around the world... Every false god, every false religion can be traced back to one place, Babylon. Amen. Amen. Babylon. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story, you find it in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now it's here that they stand in contradiction to the word of God. Because God said to Noah, Disperse and cover the whole earth. And they said, 
Let's build a city, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, this people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down there and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. The king of this first city to be built after the flood, Babylon, the king of Babylon, was Nimrod. The Bible says that Nimrod was the first man to rise to any prominence after the flood, and the Bible even calls him a mighty hunter before the Lord. This king, Nimrod, was lifted up and worshipped as God. And he was the impetus behind the building of the city of Babylon. You see, what Nimrod and the people of Babylon were attempting to do was build a city, build a structure that could withstand another deluge from God. Nimrod sought to build a city which could withstand the wrath of God. That's why the people said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. They said, let's build this thing so big that the floodwaters will never encompass it. They were attempting to save themselves, folks. To save themselves from the wrath of God in their own stream at the behest of their king, their leader. And then they decided that he was a god in his own right. Nimrod. But all they built was a false religious system. Amen. That's all they did. Nimrod is the first instance recorded in the Bible of an antichrist. Nimrod is a picture of the coming antichrist. And his Babylon, Nimrod's Babylon, is simply a reflection of that Babylon that is to come. The Babylon which the Antichrist will attempt to build during the tribulation. This is nothing more than an attempt at making a way for men and women to save themselves from the wrath of God. That's what the Antichrist, that's what the tribulation period is all about. Men trying to save themselves from the wrath of God. And this is seen, this is clearly seen in this, in the false religion of the end times, in the false government of the end times, and in the hopeless economic systems that are based on anything other than Jesus Christ. And everything that they do is based on anything other than being saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. They're trying to save themselves. They're trying to save themselves by their own religion. They're trying to save themselves by their own government. They're trying to save themselves by their own economics apart from God. I want you to think about this. I want you to consider in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist religion, the Antichrist government, the Antichrist economics is called what? Mystery Babylon. And there's a reason. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I mean, have you ever wondered why the Antichrist government is called Babylon? In the book of Revelation, it harkens back to Nimrod and the first Babylon. Everything the Antichrist will do is going to be the very same as what Nimrod tried to do at Babylon. Because Nimrod is the first Antichrist. And there are some people, they even believe that the Antichrist will be some sort of resurrected form of Nimrod. And these people of Babylon lifted up Nimrod as a god. And so they made images of him to bow down to, uh, just like we find in the book of Revelation with the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 through 15. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. you see that? An idol. They should make an image to the beast 
which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What happened in Babylon? What happened to Nimrod? What happened to his city? What happened to the people who first began to worship Nimrod and his image? The Lord came down, saw what they were doing, and scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. And this is why, okay, Babylon's God, Baal, or whom we know as Baal, B-A-A-L, from the Bible, and Nebo correspond to Egypt's gods, like Ra and Osiris. That's why Bel and Nebo correspond to Greece's gods like Jupiter and Mercurius. Or Rome's gods like Zeus and Hercules. Listen, they took that idolatry that they learned in Babylon with them when God scattered them all over the earth. And upon inspection, you're going to find behind every false religion, behind all idolatry in the world, there is Nimrod. Nimrod. And in Islam, they call him Allah. And they call his prophet Muhammad. In China, in the Far East, they call him Buddha. <laughs> you can trace all idolatry, every false religion, back to one place, the Tower of Babel. You can trace it back to one person, Nimrod. And behind Nimrod is Satan. So when people say that we're all worshiping the same God in our own way, how many of you heard people say that? Well, you ought to know that we're all just worshiping the same God in our own way. Well, they're wrong about us because we don't worship the same God as all the other religions in the world. But they are right about all those other false religions. It's all one, uh, one person who wants to be God. It's the devil's sole intention to entice, to coerce, to force men and women to worship anything, to worship everything other than God. Amen. And that's why you find so many false gods, so many antichrists in the world today. And the proliferation of false religions, listen folks, that testifies to the existence of a true faith and a true God because you cannot conceive of something that doesn't exist. And so if God didn't exist, all the false religions in the world you see would not exist. Man is incapable of creating anything ex nihilo. That means out of nothing. Amen. Man is incapable of creating, uh, creating anything out of nothing. We're not pre-existent, neither are we eternal. And we do not possess the knowledge that God does. Therefore, listen, this is how it works. We've got to have an impression of something before we can conceive a thought. Mm -hmm. That's just a fancy way of saying... We don't conceive of anything that doesn't exist. That means that God created man. Man did not create God. Because if God did not exist, man could not comprehend God. Amen. So God created man. Man did not create God. And some of these atheists are fond of saying, well, men created God so they could worship something. How do you create something that you have no conception of? You don't. But the devil has always been seeking to confuse the situation so that he can draw people away from God. Listen, the devil has been trying to steal mankind's worship from its rightful place in God and heaven. The devil's been trying to steal away uh, mankind's worship from its rightful recipient, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he's always been trying to redirect it to himself through idols. Through idols. And we're given an example from the Bible of idol worship, uh, the type of idol worship the world will experience during the tribulation by way of the Antichrist and, and his prophet. We're given an example from the Bible in Daniel chapter 3 verse 1. We're given an example in another Babylonian, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth, therefore, six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the provinces to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar told all the people 
Now that we're all here together, when you hear the band playing music, when I strike up the band, when you hear music, you bow down and worship. And the penalty for not worshiping this idol is death in a fiery furnace. The Nebuchadnezzar of the tribulation, the Nimrod of the tribulation, who we know as the Antichrist, he's going to make people do the same thing to his idol that he sets up, the one we just read about from the book of Revelation. Though the death penalty will be different. It won't be a fiery furnace. You'll lose your head if you refuse to bow down. And, and just to give you an idea of what masses of people bowing down to an idol looks like, have you ever seen a video of all the Muslims bowing down in Mecca at one time? Amen, that's right. And how do they always begin their prayer? Their call to prayer is music. You want a picture of what the Bible is describing here in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, of what's to come during the tribulation? Look at Mecca. Look at the Muslims. Look at that idolatry. Amen. The devil has been trying throughout all of history to steal men's worship away from God and divert it to idols. And behind every idol is Nimrod, and behind Nimrod is Satan. And these things, they ought, to, they ought to sound a warning. That's a wake-up call, folks. We are, uh, we are close to the days of the tribulation. The days of the tribulation are not far removed. We need to wake up. And from this, from this understanding, we now have a firm foundation for which to build our understanding of the Word of God that's given to us in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 1 through 10. Look again at verses 1 and 2. Baal bows down. <coughs> Nebo stupid. Their idols were upon their beasts and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop. They bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but they themselves are gone into captivity. This is prophecy concerning the fate of Babylon and her idols. This is Isaiah prophesying to the fate of Babylon and her gods. Baal and Nebo are two of the most prominent gods of Babylon. Uh, you find them added to the names of their kings. Belteshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Baal, and Nebo. Baal, whom we know as Baal, B-A-A-L, from the Bible, is the god. Nebo is the prophet. Okay? If that sounds familiar, it's because this. If you want an example of Baal and Nebo today, it's Allah and Muhammad. The point of the passage here, however, is that all the false gods of the world, all the false religious systems of the world, they're going to fall before God. Amen. That's what Isaiah said. Baal bows down. Nebo stoops. They're all going to fall. Everyone's idols, whether they're the ones that we make in our own mind, or whether the ones that we would actually bow down to, all these are going to fall prostrate before God. They're all going to fall and fail before God. And again, the Bible beautifully illustrates this in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All idols and all false religions are going to fall before God. Amen. All the idols in the world are going to fail. They're going to fall. Not only that, every idolater in the world is going to fall prostrate before the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says there is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every false religion, every idol will fall before God. What is more, the text points out that, that idols are powerless. Idols are powerless. They're powerless to deliver. Idols are powerless to do anything. They're, they're powerless to save anyone. In fact, the Bible says, rather than delivering people from their terrible circumstances, all that idols do is add to their burden. 
What does it say in our text? They are a burden to the weary beast. They're even a burden to the cows that have to pull them. Listen to verses 6 and 7 again. They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the abundance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it of the God. Cost a lot of money to build an idol. They fall down. Yea, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder. They carry him and set him in his place. And he stands from his place and he shall not remove. Yea, one shall cry unto him. Yet can he not answer nor save him out of his trouble? The idols of Babylon were a burden to the weary animals who had to pull the wagon home. The idols of Babylon were a financial burden uh, to those who created them as they were created at some great expense. What does it say? They lavished gold out of the bag and weighed silver in the balance. The idols of Babylon, all idols as a matter of fact, uh, were a burden to the men and women who worshipped at their feet because the Bible says they had to carry them into their own temples. They had to put them in their place. And the book of Jeremiah says they had to nail them down to the ground so they wouldn't fall over. <laughs> and for all their effort, this God that they bowed to couldn't even so much as hear them. Idols cannot deliver, folks. I, like, I was studying this, and I was reading Matthew Henry, and I thought it was very poignant. You know what Matthew Henry said about this verse about uh, men and women carrying him and to set him in his place? He says they carry their idols. They carry their idols. They have to carry their idols, making them more like a dead corpse than the living God. Isn't that about right? Amen. Amen. In contrast to this, God says in verse 3, Listen unto me. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb, even to your old age. Which means that uh, God says, I brought you into this world. I've been carrying you all your life. I'm going to carry you till you're gray, uh, you're old and gray headed. Listen to what He says. I am He, and even to the four hairs, the gray hairs, will I carry you. I have made, and I will bear. And even I will carry you and will deliver you. That's the contrast of God to idols. God is nothing like the idols that men imagine. God is nothing like the idols that people create because an idol is nothing. An idol can do nothing. That's not Old Testament, folks. That's also New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. God, in fact, says in verse 5, he says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? No idol in the world, no false religion in the world can compare to, to the Lord Jesus and faith in Him. Amen. An idol is nothing but the Lord Jesus. He's everything. Amen. We were studying that this morning with the youth. That's what I was trying to get across to them. An idol is nothing. Everything in the world is coming to nothing, but Jesus is everything. Meaning, living for Jesus is everything. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Nothing can compare to the Lord Jesus. An idol cannot deliver, but the Lord, uh, the, an idol cannot hear, neither can it deliver, but the Lord Jesus hears and delivers, 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, uh, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Amen. Amen. An idol cannot relieve burdens, but the Lord Jesus certainly can, and he certainly will. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. An idol is nothing but the Lord Jesus. He is everything. He's everything. Okay. Someone may be thinking, okay, okay, preacher, I understand what you're saying. In ancient days, these people worshipped idols and had false religions, but we're not living in those days. Listen, preacher, people don't bow down to, uh, to statues today. People today, they don't expend their lives for something that is nothing like an idol. Is that true? People in ancient days worshipped idols, and people today still worship the same idols. They just changed their name to suit their culture, changed their forms to suit their culture. And we might think of ourselves as enlightened because, you know, we don't bow down at the altar of Muhammad. We don't bow down at the statue of Buddha. 
We may think ourselves enlightened because we've not fallen prey to the foolishness that is any of the thousands of the religions around the world. We're not idolaters here, are we? We're not idolaters here unless or until we define what an, an idol is and what it is not by what idol worship looks like. Which then defines what we're truly worshiping. What I'm saying is, folks, though we may not imagine ourselves to be idol worshipers, when we examine what it is to worship an idol, we're going to find that um, many people who call themselves worshipers of Christ are in reality nothing more than idolaters dressed up in Sunday clothes. Well, that hits close to home. Yeah, Me too. Amen. You see, an idol doesn't have to be a statue. An idol doesn't have to have any corporeal form at all. An idol doesn't have to be bound up in a false religious system. An idol is simply stated, now listen, don't miss this, an idol is anything in your life that you put before God. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Anything in your life that you put in the place of God. Are you following me this morning, folks? An idol is anything that takes precedence in your life above the Lord Jesus Christ, above God in heaven above. And listen, the Bible clearly defines things such as covetousness as idolatry. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, mortify, their, uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now listen, that identifies the United States of America as being steeped in idolatry because all we've got is covetousness everywhere you turn. <laughs> An idol is anything in your life you put before God. And many people, they're going to justify themselves before God. And they're going to want to come and justify themselves to me. Listen, you don't have to justify the way you live to me at all. I'm just a preacher. I'm not God. But they'll try to justify themselves to God by coming to me and, and, and uh, they'll say, you know, preacher, I'm not what someone might call a fanatic. Preacher, I'm not a fanatic. You know, I love the Lord Jesus. I got faith in God as much as any man. I just don't go overboard with it like some folks. You know, like you preachers. I just don't go overboard. I don't wear my faith on my sleeve. I'm just no fanatic. There are some people who are so non-fanatical about Jesus, you'd have a hard time pegging them as Christians outside the church and sometimes in it. Amen. I guess some people are just more dedicated than others. Is that it? Well, you know, some people are more dedicated than others. I'm dedicated preacher. I'm just, I'm just not fanatic. I'm not, I'm not as dedicated as some other person, right? You know what people call fanatical? I call being faithful. What some people call being a fanatic, I call being dedicated. And I may be alone in this, but I'm pretty sure that it was fanatical dedication and devotion that the Lord Jesus himself called for. When he said this, listen, he that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty fanatical. Amen. Amen. And anything that is more important to you than the Lord Jesus Christ, that's an idol in your life. Anything in your life that comes before God is an idol. So the question becomes, well, how do you know if something is more important than the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you know if you've got idols in your life, things taking and drawing away uh, worship and dedication that be, should be to the Lord and drawing it away to something that is not God? How do you know? Well, let me ask you a few questions. What do you spend all your time thinking about? What do you spend all your time thinking about? What do you spend all your time talking about? What do you spend your extra income on? And some of that income which may not be extra. Listen. You ever thought about this? Some of you. 
Why does ten dollars look so small when you go to the store? When you go to the mall, you've got $10 in your pocket, and you think, oh, I don't have very much. But you put it in an offering plate, and you think it looks so big. I gave a whole $10. Come on, Come on. Do you ever suppose, you know, if I'm happy, then God must be happy? You ever think like that? Oh, there's a lot of Americans think that way. A friend of mine one day comes and says, I, I just got to be happy. Who said? Well, it's in the Constitution. So do you ever think, you know, if I'm happy, then God must be happy? Or if I'm upset and I'm angry, then God must be angry? You're an item to yourself. You're not God. How can you recognize idols in your life? Look, let me give you one sure way you can know that if you've been living your life for something other than God. Look at your children. Look at your children. And I realize right now I'm stepping on my own toes. Look at your children. Take a long, hard look at how your children are turning out or how they've already turned out because you're going to raise your children to love what you love. And you're going to raise your children to worship what you worship. Many a Christian has come to me and they're worried over their lost children. I don't understand it, preacher. I don't understand it, how I'm failing to pass my faith and values down to my children. Here's the thing. You are not failing to pass down your faith and values to them. What you see in them is what they see in you. How do you know if you're an idolater? What do your children love? What do your children worship? Because they're getting their cues from you and me. Amen. 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 I recently read this, and I think it illustrates this point very well. It says, it's tough being a kid. One of the great puzzles in my life is when Daddy spanks me for smoking a cigarette, but he threw away. And Mommy sometimes washes my mouth out with soap for saying a word I learned from her. Ever since I can remember, my parents have taught me not to tell lies, but the other day Mommy told me to tell the salesman she's not old. Remember, every word spoken before our children and every action observed contributes to the formation of their character. When I was in the army, I had the NCOs, and they'd say, I want you to do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work when you're raising children. It doesn't work with anybody. Hypocrisy is distasteful wherever you find it. Your children get their cues in life from you more than anyone else. So you're going to raise your children to live how you live. You're going to raise your children to love what you love. And your children are going to worship what you worship. So what do they see in you? Do they see genuine faith in God that manifests itself in true dedication and true devotion? Or do they see some half-hearted, lackadaisical, shallow sort of faith that is teaching them that it's better to be out on the golf course on a sunny Sunday morning than in the church worshiping the Lord? Yeah. Think about it. Amen. Or it's better to be at the lake fishing on a sunny Sunday morning than it is to be in the house of the Lord praying to Him. Think about it. In ancient times, people worshipped idols. In ancient times, people worshipped idols, and people are still worshipping idols today. Idols are a burden. Idols are expensive. Idols will destroy the lives of our families because it will lead them down a pathway straight to hell. Idols are powerless to deliver anyone in any situation they may find themselves in life. And so what is it that we can ever likened to our all-powerful, all-knowing, holy and righteous Lord and Savior. What in this world could ever take His place? It's absurd to think that anything could ever take the place of our God. Amen. And yet that's exactly what people are trying to do. Replace God. And so they set up idols. Idols in their hearts, idols in their mind, idols in their lives. And those idols... Rival God for their affection. Your idols are still in the worship that you should be given to God. And they're diverting it to the one person that you should never worship. If you've been worshiping anything other than God, can I tell you something? Today is the day to repent of that nonsense. Amen. Amen. If you've been worshiping anything other than God, today is the day to repent. And get right with God. Listen, idols are powerless to deliver you from anything. They cannot save you from the coming wrath of God. 
Therefore, if you don't repent, all that you've got coming is wrath. But if you come to Christ, he will deliver you from the wrath of God. Jesus Christ is the only one who can deliver us. If you've been worshiping idols, today is the, day, the time to repent. And I'm telling you that you can repent this morning. You can turn your back on the world. You can turn to Christ with all your heart. If you'll pray and ask the Lord Jesus to save you and deliver you, he will. Because he's the only one who can. Amen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. If you haven't been living right before God, now's the time to get right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lead in a prayer. And if you want to be saved, if you want to repent and be saved this morning, if you'll just pray with me. Now, you can pray in your heart. But I'm encouraging you to mean it with all of your heart. If you'll pray this prayer with me and mean it with all your heart, I promise you, the Lord Jesus, he will hear. Amen. And he will save and he will deliver. Just pray with me now. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I repent. I don't want to worship idols any longer. I want to worship the one true God of heaven and earth, my Lord and Savior. So the best that I know how, I repent. I just turn my back on the world and turn fully to you. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. And I'm asking you, Lord, to save me and create in me a new heart that I might live my life total devotion to you. Lord, thank you for this message, and I pray that we will take this to heart, seeing that the, the days are short. And Lord, I pray that if anyone here needs the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to work in their life, to encourage them to give their life to you, I pray that you would overcome any barriers, any obstacles. We give you praise and glory this morning because you're worthy of all our worship. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Would you just stand with me for a few minutes?